The Descendants existed within a genre of music that is known for breaking conventions and refusing traditions, but The Descendants took that one step further and kind of broke down the conventions of what punk music could be, and in doing that, sort of created their own genre. So this is the story of The Descendants and the massive impact that they had. If you end up enjoying this video, please give it a like and subscribe so you don't miss more stories from music history. Frank Nevetta and Dave Nolte met in sixth grade at Catholic school in Manhattan Beach, California, and they pretty quickly became best friends. They were both really into music and they started playing guitar around the same time so they could practice and learn together and kind of grow up as musicians together. Dave said, quote, Frank came to my school, American Martyrs, in sixth grade and I was just friends with him straight away. End quote. When he was young, Frank had a little bit of chaos in his family. I don't really know exactly what. No one really says, and it's none of my business. I just know that all of his friends understood that he had some stuff going on and that kind of led to his discontentment and his anger at basically everything. So in 1977, Frank and Dave decided to start writing some songs together with the intention of eventually starting a band. They are mostly just playing on like their little acoustic guitars at this point. When they were getting this band started, they called themselves a few different things, including The Itch, before Frank suggested The Descendants, and he at least claims that he misspelled it on purpose. Seems like a thing he would do, so I believe him. But they were struggling to find anyone else who was interested in joining their band, so Dave left that project to focus on the band that he had with his brothers, which was called The Last, and it was a pretty interesting band that was actually gaining a little bit of traction. The Last essentially tried to fuse garage rock with surf pop, and it was way more pop-centric than I would expect from that typical SST record scene. But then in 1978, Bill Stevenson, who was already a really big fan of The Last, joined up with Frank and Dave to kind of relaunch The Descendants project. Bill Stevenson was born in 1963 in Torrance, California. His father, Steve, worked two jobs and was gone most of the time. When he was 14, Bill started working at the Hermosa Tackle Box, which was a fishing shop on Hermosa Beach owned by Keith Morris's father. Through Keith, Bill was introduced to punk music. Keith said that essentially Bill just came up to him and was like, what should I be listening to? So Keith kind of took him under his wing and showed him all of the cool bands like The Last. As Keith described it, all of the bands around them at that time were top 40 pop music like Fleetwood Mac and The Eagles, and that's why The Last were so important. They were offering something new and exciting in this world just saturated with bands like The Bee Gees. No shade towards The Bee Gees. I like a lot of their stuff. I even have a video on them. Go check it out if you want to learn more about The Bee Gees. Joe, who was Dave's brother and the frontman of The Last, said, quote, I, like a lot of others, was dissatisfied by the state of rock music. I couldn't wait to get out there and start going to all of the great shows, only to find that as the early 70s developed, that all the really good people died, end quote. And then he found the Ramones, and that inspired him to start doing his own thing and be one of those musicians that he looked up to when he was a kid. Dave Nolte already knew Bill Stevenson from school, and he always thought that Bill would be a super fun person to be in a band with, despite the fact that Bill had no idea how to play any instruments. He just thought that Bill had the right attitude for a band. Dave started to give Bill early demos that the last recorded, and that really inspired Bill, so much so that he took one of those demos home and overdubbed it, and then gave it back to Dave, and then Dave showed it to Frank, and they were all super impressed with what Bill had done. Joe, Dave's older brother, said that when Dave and Frank heard that demo tape, they said, quote, Oh my god, he may smell of fish, and he may seem kind of weird, but this is the guy. He's better than we are. End quote. So they invited him into the Descendants, and that's when things really started to gain some momentum for the group. Frank and Bill pretty quickly hit it off and became really good friends. Bill said they'd go fishing together basically every single day. Bill said about Frank, quote, He had this bitter resentment that drenched every step he took and every word he spoke. His songs were filled with that. 
end quote. Soon after, Bill found a base just kind of sticking out of a neighbor's trash can, so he saved that bass and took it home and started to write some songs on it and learn how to play it a little bit. The first song he ever wrote was My Age from Milo Goes to College. Milo explained that Bill had this kind of weird quirk when he was in high school of adding edge to the end of just random nouns. So when he wrote a song, he brought it to them and he was like, this is my song. So became my age. Pretty soon, the band started rehearsing in Long Beach at Frank's brother's house, which just so happened to be near where Tony Lombardo lived. Tony was originally from South Bay, but he moved to Long Beach in order to attend California State University. Tony would kind of just hang out in his garage and play bass by himself, and one day Frank overheard that and was really impressed. Tony said they all just kind of like came over and just stood and watched him play in his garage. So they invited him over to jam, even though Tony was like twice the age of the other guys in the group, but Bill said he looked and acted really young for his age. He was 34 years old when he joined the band, and the rest of the guys were 15. So when Bill and Frank started to get a little bit off the rails and act a little bit too crazy, Tony was able to step in and be kind of a voice of reason for the group. Soon after Tony joined, Dave kind of realized that he couldn't be in two bands. He was just being pulled in too many different directions, so he needed to quit one to focus on the other. He chose to focus on the last, so he left the Descendants. And at the time, that seemed like a pretty smart decision. The last were gaining a lot of traction in the local area, and the Descendants were like barely off the ground. In 1979, they went into a studio to record their first single, which Dave produced, called Ride the Wild, and with It's a Hectic World as the B-side. They released it on their own label, which they called Orca Records, named after Bill's fishing boat, and Bill ended up selling that single to a friend of his named Milo Ackerman, who really liked it and started tagging along to band practices. Eventually, they started booking a few gigs and playing some shows. Their first show was actually opening for a band called The Minutemen, which is another video on this channel, so it'll be linked in the description below if you want to hear more about them. But with all of this practicing and playing, they kind of quickly outgrew that first batch of songs that they had written. Bill said, quote, By the time we learned how to play well enough to be competent and proficient, and also by the time we figured out, oh, there's these little record labels that will put your stuff out, we were sick of all of these songs and we thought our new batch was better, end quote. According to Milo, they were more of like a poppy new wave band at this point, and for a while, I think like six months, they were even fronted by a female lead singer named Cecilia Loera, who was honestly criminally overlooked in a lot of the research that I did for this video. She's not even mentioned in their like official documentary, which is really strange to me. But from what I can tell, she was only with the Descendants for a few months, I think six months, and she was kind of a periphery figure in the LA punk scene after that. She started going by Cecilia plus minus, but like the plus minus are on top of each other. I, I don't know how to say that. I barely know how to say real names. And she fronted the band Angel of the Odd before she passed away in 2008 from Wilson's disease. Meanwhile, while the band was kind of like working on and perfecting these new batches of songs, Milo was becoming the biggest Descendants fan in the world. Bill would drive him to basically all of their practices where Milo would sit and watch them until one practice, he started thinking that he could probably sing It's a Hectic World. So they told him, just go ahead and try it since the mic is already set up. But Bill claims that it was Frank who actually suggested that Milo start singing. Bill said that all of Frank's ideas were genius, so he credits him for most of the early Descendants work. He said that Frank was the one who realized that Milo would be a good singer, but he was too shy to ask, and Frank and Tony were getting real tired of singing the songs that they had written. But however it exactly happened, Milo was officially in the band. Milo said, quote, Bill would sell copies of their first single to classmates at our high school, and it blew me away. I went to watch them play and just stepped up to the mic and said, I can sing this because I've been listening to this record nonstop, and we kept going from there, end quote. Milo also claimed that his joining was what convinced them to kind of shift their sound since he had more of that like gravelly kind of voice so he didn't fit that poppy new wave style they were going for and it led to them speeding up their songs and being a little bit more aggressive. Milo Ackerman was born in Lomita, California in 1967. In high school, he became really fascinated with the structure of DNA and experiments done by biochemists like Stanley Cohen. Naturally, for a high schooler interested in molecular biology, he was a really good student, and he said, quote, My parents definitely had an expectation that I would be an academic type person, but I needed a place to get my yayas out and actually be different, end quote. But along with his interest in 
science-y stuff, he was also interested in music from a really early age. He said, quote, I took a little piano growing up. I dabbled in a variety of instruments, literally just dabbled in because I would take a lesson and be like, this is boring. He also dabbled in the school choir and singing and a few other little things, but by the age of 12, he had become a little bit self-conscious about it and was basically just a music listener. I feel like I probably could have just cut all of that out and let Milo explain the story. He said, quote, So I'm listening to those bands, and then I see Bill, the drummer of The Descendants, who is in my geometry class, selling this little single he's done. He's like, you want to buy a copy? That was The Descendants' first single, Ride the Wild, slash It's a Hectic World. I was instantly smitten. After listening to it for a while, I got up the courage to ask him, hey, can I watch you guys practice? They would play the song, but they wouldn't necessarily sing it. I said, well, that mic is set up for some reason, and I know how to sing the song from your record, so I'm going to sing it. And they're like, go for it, dude. So I sang Ride the wild. It was not this mind-blowing thing to either them or me, but they thought I had a lot of energy, and shortly after that, they let me in the band." End quote. When Milo joined the band, they started to write a lot faster and more aggressive songs, largely inspired by the Bad Brains' first single, Pay to Come. They heard that single and became inspired to play as fast as they possibly could. I have a Bad Brains video, so you can watch that if you want more information, but essentially Bad Brains are kind of famous for being super technically proficient musicians who could play much faster than anyone else could at that time. Tony actually developed this method of like taping fishing weights to his hand while he practiced playing the bass and he only played downstrokes. So when he took the fishing weights off, his arm felt lighter and he could go even faster. They also started getting really into coffee, which kind of helped them keep the energy up. They, are, they were drinking pretty in insanely unhealthy amounts at one point in their lives. When they started planning on recording their debut album, they were kind of in a weird place. Milo said, quote, We didn't know how else to be. All we could do is be ourselves, but ourselves doesn't make for a good punk rock band. End quote. A lot of the bands, especially in the hardcore LA scene at that time, were more political and more violent and aggressive, and that just didn't feel right for the Descendants. That wasn't who they were as people. They were writing and performing songs about getting screwed over by a girl they liked in high school. Instead of trying to put on a front and act like they were these tough macho punk men, they were putting themselves out there, and that felt like a real risk for them. But it also made them much more relatable. It felt authentic and real to a lot of kids who maybe were more like them, but loved this punk music and felt like they couldn't connect with like the Henry Rollins type figure. So Milo became something of a spokesperson for a different kind of punk outcast. But Bill said, quote, personally, I think people give us a little more credit than we deserve for even knowing what we were doing. We lived in our own little bubble and it was like, these are the songs we have. So this is what the album is going to be, end quote. So he's saying they're not trying to create any kind of like massive statement with it. It's just this is who we are, so we're going to do that. But I think that in itself is a statement. Instead of trying to conform to what was happening around them, they decided to just be themselves. Around this time, Bill went on a fishing trip with his friend Pat, and they developed this kind of way of thinking called all. It was just kind of essentially this desire to put all of yourself into whatever you're doing to achieve the most you can possibly achieve out of it. And that philosophy became something of a religion for them, and they started to put all of themselves into the songs they were writing. Bill said, quote, The quest for all became the main catalyst of the band, and we adopted this omni-ambitious way of life, for better and for better, end quote. In 1981, they recorded their debut EP in Hollywood, produced by a guy named Spot, who was the resident producer for most of the early SST releases. They released it on New Alliance Records, which was founded by Minutemen members D. Boone and Mike Watt. A lot of punk magazines really loved it right away, and it felt like they kind of understood what Descendants were going for, and that inspired the Descendants to really put everything they had into their debut LP. When they started working on the songs for this debut LP, they described themselves as outcasts. Bill said he didn't really have any other friends outside of the people in the band, and rehearsals became their main way to socialize. In June of 1982, once again with Spot as the producer, they went into a studio in Redondo Beach. They took some songs that they had been playing for a long time, like Parents, which was one of the first that Frank ever wrote, I think, along with some new songs and 
made an album. The resulting album, Milo Goes to College, still had that aggressive, fast edge, but it wasn't all about being fast. They added more melody into the songs. Bill said, quote, by the time we recorded Milo Goes to College, the pendulum swung somewhere maybe in the middle. There's a lot of melodic and pop elements to it, but it also has that sense of bitter resentment. End quote. The title of the album is in reference to Milo quite literally going to college and leaving the band. According to Bill, Milo was always super clear about the fact that he would be leaving eventually. Even though they had started to gain a little bit of traction within the Southern California music scene, apparently there was just no question of Milo leaving to pursue a career in science. They were all prepared for that. Milo Goes to College was released once again through New Alliance Records in September of 1982 and is now considered to be one of the pivotal albums of that... 80s California punk movement, and I believe it's the album that essentially created pop punk. It's really hard to overstate the influence and importance of that album on so many different musicians and genres throughout the years. Joey Cape from Lagwagon said, quote, it changed my life. I realized you could make a punk record and have that pop sensibility, but also be intricate, end quote. And Dave Grohl said, quote, if Descendants had made Milo Goes to College in 1999, they'd be living in mansions, end quote. The artwork on that album came from a guy named Jeff Rat Atkins, who drew it based on artwork done by their classmate named Roger, who drew these like little caricatures in order to taunt Milo and kind of like present him as the class nerd. Despite all of the good things I just said about the album, by the time it came out, Milo had already left the band to go to college to study biology at the University of California in San Diego. Once Milo left, despite this enormous album that they just put out, the band kind of went on hold. They tried bringing in a guy named Ray Cooper to take over on Vogue vocals, but then Bill joined Black Flag, and that kind of put an end to the Descendants for a bit. Bill had become something of the creative force of the band, so with him stepping out, didn't make much sense to keep going. Tony said that it was Bill's desire to take the band out on the road that was the final nail in the coffin to this first iteration of the Descendants. Tony said, quote, Bill kind of sat down with me and Frank and said something to the effect of, we were at a point where we needed to grow by going on the road. Frank said no, and I had to say no also, so he said he had to leave the band and we were both kind of bummed out. I don't think Frank even believed him at first. That was a bad scenario. End quote. Bill's experience with Black Flag's somewhat relentless touring schedule probably gave him that perspective of you need to hit the road if you wanted to be successful in this community. Ray Cooper and Tony decided to continue on very briefly as the Ascendants, while Frank kind of took a different path. Frank one day set all of his musical equipment on fire and moved to Oregon to become a full-time fisherman. Frank would reunite with the Descendants to work on some songs for an album called Everything Sucks that we'll get to in a little bit, and for a few like reunion shows, but he was never again a full member of the band that he founded. He and Bill remained pretty close until October 31st of 2008 when Frank passed away. Bill said that Frank's family got into contact with him and told him that Frank, quote, died from a diabetic coma and he never came to, he just died in his sleep. But suffice it to say that Frank was in very poor health. Maybe the last 10 years of his life, I saw a real decline there. End quote. But back in 1985, Bill is still in Black Flag, but then he starts writing songs and he talked to Milo about them and he said, these aren't Black Flag songs, these are Descendants songs, we should try and do something with this. And then Milo heard some demos of those songs and agreed that they were really good and they needed to work on them. So Milo and Bill called up Ray and Tony to get to work on their second studio album called I Don't Wanna Grow Up, released in 1985. They learned all of the songs and recorded it in about two weeks. Milo said, quote, We could have put more practice time into it, but I think the songs themselves are really good songs, end quote. Bill was determined to make the Descendants something bigger than what they were, so he left Black Flag and planned out this whole tour for the group. Unfortunately, Tony had just gotten a new job with the Postal Service and bought a new house, so he wasn't really inclined to tour. So instead, he left the group and that's a decision that he still says he regrets. He said, quote, I feel like I was born a descendant. It was the best time of my life, and I'd still be doing it if I could, end quote. Tony kept his job with the Postal Service until he retired in 2005, and he played in some 
small punk bands in the community. But I think as of a few years ago, he said that he had officially stopped playing music of any kind. To replace him, Bill turned to Doug Carrion. Doug was a friend from their high school, and he had played in a few punk bands like Con 800 and Anti. Bill left him a note on his door saying that they were restarting Descendants, and Tony couldn't do it, so they wanted him to step in. So, with a new album and with Milo back, they hopped in a van and started playing as many shows as they possibly could. They did three tours in support of I Don't Want to Grow Up and then took a bit of a break to record a new album called Enjoy, which was released in 1986 with Bill as the producer. They kind of solidified their sound a bit more on this album, and at least in terms of their musicianship, you could tell that they had more practice. But the very immature humor and subject matter kind of turned off a lot of music critics, but a lot of their friends kind of describe it as the best encapsulation of who they were as people. If you don't know, that whole album is essentially toilet themed. It's it's a weird experience. There's a whole like recorded fart in it. Just, Just listen to it. It's weird. In 1986, Doug decided to leave the band because he wanted to keep experimenting. He said, quote, it was like, okay, cool. You're taking the ship north. I'm going south. Roger. Doug continued to have a pretty successful career in the music industry. He joined a band called Doggy Style, and then he moved to DC to be in Dag Nasty. He's somewhat recently returned to music, starting his own band called Doug C and the Blacklisted. And at the same time, Ray Cooper decided to leave, and no one is quite sure why he'd wanted to leave. He seems kind of like a more shy and withdrawn type of person, so maybe just the whirlwind of being in The Descendants was a little bit too much for him. He got too tired and drained by it and just wanted to step back. I'm not too sure what he ended up doing after he left the band. Someone from The Descendants said that he ended up up north in a hot romance, so whatever that means. To replace Doug, the Descendants found Carl Alvarez. Carl, who had been a longtime fan of the Descendants, was in a few bands himself in the Salt Lake City area, and he was playing a show in Boise, Idaho, when a guy that he was staying with got a call from Bill Stevenson. Bill called that guy and basically said that Doug had left and they were looking for a new bassist, but that guy he called had, like, family obligations and he couldn't do it, so... Carl was sitting right there and he grabbed the phone and he was like, I can do it. Carl said that when he started playing with the Descendants, he and Bill had instant chemistry on stage, but then he realized that was probably because Carl practiced playing bass to Bill's drumming. And it was Carl who introduced the group to Ray's replacement, Stefan Egerton. Stefan O'Reilly was born in Utah in 1964, and he said that his parents really loved music and had a pretty wide range of records, which he really loved as a kid. He said, quote, A lot of 50s and 60s rock and roll as a kid and a little jazz. My mother had good taste in music, and I grew up with a great variety. When I was 11, a neighbor lent me Frank Zappa's Absolutely Free, which sparked my interest in unusual music, end quote. Carl met Stefan when they were 12 in junior high in Salt Lake City. City, and Carl said that he basically learned how to play with Stefan. Stefan was living in this little one-bedroom apartment, and all he really had was his guitar and his bike. So punk really felt perfect for him. It felt like this working class music. And then Stefan called Carl to kind of congratulate him on joining the Descendants, this band that they both loved. And that's when Stefan learned that they were also looking for a guitarist. Stefan said, quote, the idea that it was Carl, my oldest friend, and I joining this band that were so huge to us, it was like living on a cloud. End quote. In January of 1987, this new iteration of The Descendants went into the studio to work on their next album, which was once again produced by Bill. And when that album, called All, released in June of 1987, it had some pretty mixed reviews. But Bill was really happy with it, and he said probably only My Logos to College came closer to capturing the sound they were going for than all. Carl and Stefan had brought a new sound and a new energy into The Descendants and kind of revitalized it. But after a spring and summer tour in support of that album, Milo once again decided to leave in order to pursue a PhD and a career in science. He said, quote, I had the opportunity to go and achieve all more in science, and I decided to take that opportunity, end quote. Once Milo left, Bill recruited Dave Smalley from Dag Nasty and rechristened the band All. Bill said, quote, Milo has stuck with me for almost nine years now, so I wouldn't exactly feel right about just continuing to call us the Descendants. In a sense, that would be kind of like discrediting Milo's nine years worth of effort, end quote. For the interest of time, I'm not going to cover all that band, even though it's kind of the same band, just with a new singer. But Milo said that he immediately missed being in a band 
for the most part. He said, quote, I missed it from the moment I left. You always miss being up on stage. There are other things you don't miss, though. I didn't necessarily miss spending 23 out of 24 hours being in a van, driving from place to place, getting sick. I was always getting sick on the road there. End quote. By 1995, Milo was working at DuPont doing research on plant DNA, and he was starting to feel a little bit dissatisfied with the way that his science career was going. He said, quote, I knew that in biology I had to do a postdoc, but I figured I would do that and automatically I'd be in line for a faculty position and then right off into the sunset. The postdoc was kind of slow moving and I didn't make as much progress as I would have liked. At some point in the middle of it, I experienced a real loss of confidence slash faith slash enthusiasm for it. I'm hoping to return to it with a more realistic perspective and maybe a little bit more oomph, end quote. Maybe it was that frustration with his science career that led him to to want to get back into punk music to kind of work through some of that anger and disappointment and frustration. I mean, what better vehicle to do that than punk music? But whatever the reason, by 1995, he was ready to rejoin the band. By 1995, Dave had already left all and he was replaced by a guy named Chad Price. So when Milo said he wanted to rejoin, Bill thought about it and he didn't want to just kick Chad out of the band, but he also still wanted to work with Milo, so he decided to just keep all going with Chad as the singer and restart the Descendants with Milo as the singer. He said, quote, Milo couldn't be all singer because Chad is all singer. So we decided that we could be descendants with Milo and all with Chad, end quote. He also stressed that there was absolutely no resentment with Milo and Chad. They helped each other out on recordings, doing like backing vocals on each other's albums. And it's worth noting that Milo was always like around the band. He didn't just completely disassociate himself from them. They were always friends and he would jump in and help out with all whenever he could. He would go to a lot of their shows and like be in the crowd. And he said he was there just kind of like, missing being up on stage with the guys and then bill would call him up on stage and he'd get to do a few songs so he'd still been around and he said that rejoining the band was mostly just being reintroduced to the songwriting process so in the summer of 1996 the band went back into a studio that was owned and operated by bill to start working on a new album that studio was in colorado and it was called the blasting room and bill explained how owning that studio was a real game changer in the recording process they didn't have to worry about paying for time anymore so they could kind of go at their own pace and try a few more things. Also, Tony and Frank came back around to contribute a little bit to this album. They released that album called Everything Sucks in September of 1996. All had previously signed with a major label, but they didn't really like that experience, so both All and The Descendants signed with Epitaph Records to release their next albums. It became their first album to chart. I mean, it, it only reached number 132, but still, it's higher than I've ever gotten an album. They supported it with a series of tours, even hitting Europe for a stretch. Then for the next decade, they were kind of on and off as Milo's science career allowed. They released another album in 2004 on Fat Mike's label called Cool To Be You. And after that, they kind of disbanded for quite a while. During that time, they would play a couple shows, but Milo always stressed that they were one-off shows and the band was not reforming. But then in 2015, Bill announced that they were working on new material, which became their next album, Hypercaffeum Spazinate in 2016. And after that album, Milo announced that he would be officially leaving his science career in order to focus full-time on The Descendants. He said that he was feeling pretty burnt out with his science career, so when DuPont laid him off, he decided now is the time to just really go all in on music. And Milo said since rejoining the band, he's kind of remembered how much he loved the other guys. They were never not friends, but you know, you kind of drift apart as you get busy doing things as you get older. So he said rejoining them was like rediscovering his best friends again. And that's the story of the Descendants. They are still out there, still touring. Make sure you go catch them if you can. I think they have created some incredible music. They were such an important staple of that early California punk scene. And there's just no counting the number of really important bands that they influenced and inspired. So leave a comment of anything that I missed, anything that I got wrong. I'm sure there's something. Remember to like the video if you ended up liking it and leave a comment with how you feel about The Descendants. Maybe a time you got to see them perform, your feelings towards your favorite album, just how this band is important to you. I always love reading those comments. I think it's a really cool thing to get to talk about and get to share. And then don't forget to subscribe for more stories from music history.